Well hello Internet and welcome to part 15 of my C video tutorial. Today I'm going to cover how we can pass memory addresses between functions, bitwise operators, sign integers, shift operators, twos complement, bit masking, and a whole bunch of other different things. If you missed any of the previous parts of this tutorial I provide a link in the upper right hand corner and I have a whole bunch to do so let's get into it. Okay so this is some information that we have left after our last two parts of our tutorial and one of you guys asked me how exactly could we pass this memory location that we are using back and forth between two different functions. Well there's a couple little things we need to change here and if you want to consider this a start of the class quiz you could pause the video and do it yourself and see if you get the same results that I got. So basically what we want to do is create a buffer just like before that's going to hold 32 bits plus a null character at the end and so we're going to do it in much the same way. I'm going to say p converted number right like that and then I'm going to have to take the p converted number and allocate some memory for it which we've covered this guy before allocate some memory and basically if I want a 32 bit buffer plus an all character that means I need 33 and what am I going to be storing inside of it I'm going to be storing characters inside of it so there we go and we got that all set up and what this is going to allow us to do is now say go print f and call our string to print it out on our screen and then what we're going to do is call convert base just like we did this guy up here and then we're going to pass inside of it the number to convert and the base but we're also going to pass in the memory location that we want this information stored inside. So I'm just going to say I want to pass in number six I want it to be converted into binary and then I'm going to pass in p converted number inside of there and what that's going to do for us is print that information out on the screen. Now remember anytime we allocate memory we of course want to free it and that's exactly what we're going to do when we are done with the main function. Now all we need to do is jump up inside of convert base and change a couple things. So here we are up inside of convert base and of course that information is going to be passed inside of here so I need to catch it and we no longer are going to need this buffer and we're no longer going to need to define this information that we want to save here for our character array. We do however still need this guy to be able to actually generate the different bases and so forth that we need. We're going to continue using this guy because we want to make sure we get usable information. However, we have absolutely no use for this because we already have memory set aside, p converted number, and we can just say 32 if we want to save the null character just like we did before. And then everything else here is going to be set up exactly the same, except in this situation I don't think it makes sense to print twice. So let's get rid of that, file save that, let's check to see if it works. So here is our terminal, and if we execute it, you can see the answer, 110 shows up, which is the binary representation of the number 6. Alright, so now what I want to do is cover bitwise operators, and they sound way more complicated than they really are, so let's just get rid of this, don't need that, but we still are going to need our memory location because that's the way everything has been set up. And the very first bitwise operator I'm going to deal with here is exactly how AND works. So I'm going to create an unsigned int just like before and I'm going to call this and solution and to use it I'm just going to use these two guys number six and number seven up here paste that in there and throw an ampersand inside of it and then number seven and that's going to be our result after using the and bitwise operator and in essence what it's going to do is it's taking 110 which is six and we're going to go and 111 which is 7 and it is going to spit out on the screen a 1 for each situation in which both of these numbers start with 1 and there also you see exactly the same thing happening however in this situation that's a 0 and that's a 1 so that means that's going to be a 0 and that's going to be our result so let's just get rid of that and let's print it out so if we go print f print out our string and go and then we're going to be printing out convert base and we're going to pass in number six and we want it to be binary p converted number and this is just being done just so that it looks nice and it pres presents itself nice on our screen and i'm going to print this out three times here i'm going to put an equal sign replace this with seven everything else is going to stay exactly the same and then down here i'm just going to replace this with two new lines and then pass in the and solution like that and if we come in here and execute that you're going to see 11006 and 111 or 7 is equal to 110. And that is how the AND bitwise operator works. 
Now I'm going to show you the OR operator, and it is quite simple. We don't even have to change many. I'm just going to call this OR solution, and instead of an AND, I'm going to put an OR inside of there. There you go. And basically, it's going to return a 1 if either of these binary numbers contains a 1. So I'll just change this to an OR as well. All the rest of this stuff can stay exactly the same. And then change this to OR. File save and execute. And there you can see exactly what happened. 110, 111. It comes back with 111 because all we require is one of these values to be equal to 1 for us to get a 1 as a result. Totally makes sense. And that brings us to the exclusive OR. I'm just going to call this EX with a capital O inside of it. And it has that little carrot shape inside of there. And basically what it's going to do is a 1 is going to be returned only if one of the numbers is equal to one and the other is equal to zero. So really simple, just to come in here and show you exactly what that looks like. Don't even need to change anything. Change this to exclusive or run the code and compile. And in this situation, you can see only in one situation do we have a zero and one situation we have a one. And that's the reason why one is returned. And I don't have this set up to always force the zeros to show up. So that's the reason why you only see one digit there instead of three. And that brings us to the world of how signed integers are represented inside of C. Now, signed data can make things just a little bit more complicated. And if you think about how exactly we could represent a negative number, say, inside of C, we might say that if we want to use the number 3 and represent it in memory as negative, we could just put a 1 here and allow this to be 3. And that is a very logical way to actually represent negative numbers inside of memory. However, that is not the way that computers represent numbers inside of memory. Computers instead take, say, the number 2, which is what this binary number here represents, and they use something that is called the 2's complement. To get to the negative 2, what they are going to do is invert all of the numbers. So if we have a zeros up inside of here, we are going to change those into ones, just as you can see right here. And if we have a one, we're going to change that into a zero. And I'm going to show you here in a second how easy that is to do. Then to get to the final negative two value, we are simply going to add one to this number right here to get our final result. And what's really cool about this is if we want to change from negative two back to positive two, all we do is take our negative 2 representation in binary language, which is this up here. We invert the numbers just like we did before, and we add 1 again. And there you can see we're back to 2. So I promised you an easy way to perform this calculation, so now I'm going to show it to you. And that tool that we're going to use is called the 1's complement operator. And all it does is flips all the bits, just like we showed here before. So what I'm going to do is come into this guy and I'm going to call this ones comp solution and if I want to change number six I want to invert it all I do get rid of that altogether and throw a tilde in front of it right like that now I can come down inside of here I'm going to throw a tilde inside of there just so we can see exactly what's going on get rid of this all together throw an equal sign in there call convert base number six so that we'll be able to see what's going on here on our screen Get rid of this altogether. Don't need it. Leave that the same, except I'm going to take this guy right here, throw that inside of there, file save it. And then just so we can have a little bit more information on our screen, I'm also going to say negative of D, like this, is equal to this. And then just so we can have a little bit more information on our screen, I'm going to say negative of, and this is going to be number six, but I'm going to put a D inside of there, is equal to and I'm going to get my ones complement solution and I'm going to add one to it so that you can see exactly how this works here. And then I'm going to pass in number six like that. And then I'm going to go ones comp solution plus one. File save it, compile and execute. And you can see it printed out the whole entire thing here, but you can also see that it basically just inverted all of those numbers. And then you can also see that it all worked because I have negative of six is equal to negative six. So that's how we're going to be able to convert between signed integers and unsigned integers. Now I'll do a little explanation of exactly how shift operators work. And it basically they just allow you to shift bits to the left or to the right. And there's positives and negatives to doing that. Gonna get rid of this all together here. And this guy right here, I'm gonna call shift left two because that's exactly what it's gonna do. And if I want to shift the bits for number six, all I'm going to do, if I want them to go to the left, is just put two of those little signs inside of there and then put a two. 
Now I can come in here, get rid of this tilde, like that, two, equal sign, let this be number six, just like it was before. Here, put an equal sign, print out a little bit more information than we did before. Come in here, say shift, left two, come down here, and then print out shift, left two on the screen, compile, and execute. And there you can see, if we take the number six and shift it left two bytes, that's what you're gonna get which is going to be exactly the same as the number 24. So it's a interesting way to be able to do all kinds of calculations, which we're gonna get into here at a later date. And if there is a way to shift to the left, of course there's a way to shift to the right. So I'm just gonna change this to right. And then if I wanna to shift to the right instead of shifting to the left, I just go like that, change this as well so it makes sense. Change that to right and change that to the right. File save, compile. Execute. And here you can see, if we take six and shift it to the right by two spaces, you get one, which of course is equal to one. Okay, now let's take a look at bit masking. Now basically, bit masking is used to select parts of a series of bits that you have. And it's very easy to do. Basically, what you need to do is use a guy like this, which is what we call a mask. And let's say I have this number and I want to find out exactly what just this bit, this bit, this bit, and this bit are. What I do with my mask is I put a one everywhere in regards to the bits that I want to retrieve, and then I perform a and bitwise operator on it. And of course, it's only gonna return a one if this is a one, and it's going to return a zero if this is a zero. And I don't need to, of course, just take these all in a row. I can just get this bit and this bit if that's what I wanted to do. So let's take a look at exactly how that would work. I'm gonna get rid of whole bunch of this information just to get it out of our way. And I'm gonna create a variable, I'm gonna call it analyze my bits. And I'm gonna make it equal to 170, which is gonna be exactly the same as 1010010. And then I'm gonna have two more unsigned ints. I'm gonna create a mask here, and I'm gonna make it equal to 15. And that is going to have a value of 111. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to grab or find out exactly what those bits are and disregard everything else. Then down with this guy right here, let's say I want to call it last four bits because that's exactly what it's going to get. And then I just take the bits that I want to analyze, throw them inside of there, use and on them, and then put my mask at the other end of it. And in essence, what this is going to do for me is take this guy right here, throw that in there, take my mask, and then after that it's going to return zero for the things I'm not interested in, and then one zero one zero for the things I am interested in. And to print that information out, what I'm gonna do is go print F and say last four bits, and then I'm gonna call my convert base, pass in last four bits, convert it into two, or base two, P converted number. Compile and execute, and you can see, there it is. Last four bits, one zero one zero. So that's exactly how bit masking works. Now for the final thing, what I'm gonna cover is how to represent fractions inside of binary, because this is something that confuses a lot of people. I'm gonna keep this nice and simple. Let's just say that we wanna represent 0.625 inside of binary numbers. How exactly would you do that? Or how would they be saved inside of memory? Well, just to keep this nice and simple, let's just say that we have four bits inside of memory and that is where we wanna save this information. Well, what we're going to do is we are going to take our fraction and we're going to multiply it times 2. And what we're going to get whenever we do that is 1.25. We're then going to take the 1 part of that and throw it over here. Then we're going to take the 0.25, move it down, multiply it times 2, and we're going to get 0 0.50. Then we're going to take this 0 right here and throw it over into memory. Then we're going to take the 0 0.50, move it down, multiply it times 2, then we're gonna take this one and throw it over there. And now since we no longer have anything to multiply times, this is going to be the representation of our fraction inside of memory. Now sometimes things don't work that well. Of course we have things in the world called infinite fractions. Now we are going to have things like 0.1 and whenever we multiply that times two, we're gonna get 0.2 and the binary representation for that would be zero. And then we take 0.2, which is moved down from here, multiply that times two, then we're gonna get 0.4, then we're gonna have zero, zero in memory, then we're gonna take the 0.4, multiply it times two, and so forth and so on. And you can see right here, eventually we get a one. Well, this is one of the reasons why most programming languages have trouble in regards to precision in regards to fractions. 
like we saw in the last part of the tutorial, everything works out whenever we don't have infinite fractions, but when we do have infinite fractions, we can run into trouble. And now for your homework, take all the information that I showed you right here in regards to binary numbers, write a function like that, and leave any questions or comments below. Otherwise, till next time.